Some of you may know my work around CDC, and I'm generally the nuts and bolts guys about communication. But today I'd like to use this forum and talk about a broader subject. I'd like to talk about arguments, specifically why it's so difficult to win an argument, even if you know you're right. Let's start with this as a given. You can't win an argument. By definition, it's an argument. You just can't win. I mean, how many times have you been in a conversation with somebody, a reasonable person, you start to have a discussion, realize you're on opposite sides of the debate, and no matter how many facts and figures you have, and you have facts and figures, you just can't get them to see your point of view. I mean, why is Congress so polarized that they're paralyzed? Why are liberals and conservatives unable to talk or even compromise on anything? Well, there's actually a name for this, and we'll get to that in a minute. But first, what we need to do is break down the mechanics of an argument and see what it's really all about. An argument is an exchange of diverging views or opposite views. Typically, it's a heated or an angry exchange, and it's the definition that most of us relate to. Let me break this complex subject down to the simplest form. Here's an example. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Are you kidding me? Okay, everybody with me so far? Here's another variation of the same. You did too, I did not. Did too, did not, wanna bet? Yeah, how much? Right? These are arguments. They're intractable. You can't win. Here's another more complicated version. It's the famous he said, she said variation. And this often has relationship implications, and it's something you want to avoid at all costs. Now, when I was a kid, I used to play baseball. People played softball. We played all kinds of sports. And there were constantly arguments. She's safe. She's out. Oh, yeah, she was safe by a mile. Well, not from my angle. She was out. But we didn't have umpires. We didn't have coaches on the sandlots. We didn't have helicopter parents standing around and, you know, helping us make these decisions. We had to make the decisions ourselves. So generally, what we did was the do-over. Just play the play over. Whatever it was, however it turned out, that was it. That was the way it was supposed to be. But sometimes we couldn't do a do-over, so we used a more sophisticated way of solving our, which was rock, paper, scissors, right? But to be honest with you, to this day, I don't know which is rock, paper. I don't know which one beats which. So I prefer throwing fingers, right? Throw fingers. It was, we called it odds and evens. You throw two fingers or one finger, you call odds and evens. Whoever wins, wins unless somebody calls two out of three, then you had to do two out of three. But in life, it's not that simple. We cannot do do-overs on big policy decisions. And we can't use rock, paper, scissors to convince people about our point of view. So let's go to the second dictionary definition of argument, which is a reason or a set of reasons that we use to convince somebody. Now, um, if you've heard my webinar on presenting science, you'll hear me explain that we display the data, we communicate the facts in a way that makes sense, no matter who the audience is. And that's fine. But with some arguments, you can have all the data in the world, the best data in the world, and you have that data. But at the end of your diatribe, not diatribe, I mean discussion, at the end of your discussion, your opponent simply says, I don't believe you. Now, you just laid out your whole case, rock-solid evidence, and the other side just says no. The fact is, and I fully understand the irony of what I'm saying here, the fact is the name for this condition is confirmation bias, also known as my side bias. We see and hear what fits our expectations. One side says we've got to raise taxes, to stimulate the economy. The other side says we have to cut taxes 
to stimulate the economy. You can look at the exact same set of statistics. And one side will say, raise the minimum wage to $15 an hour to lift people out of poverty. The other side will say, that's simply going to put small business into bankruptcy. How can there be such polar opposites when people are looking at the same set of data? Everything is right or wrong. Confirmation bias discourages compromise. According to a 1998 paper by Raymond Nickerson of Tufts University, confirmation bias means, and I'm quoting here, the seeking or interpreting of evidence in ways that are partial to existing beliefs. In other words, you believe what you want to believe. You gather data that fits your world view. I mean, it's perfectly obvious. The world is flat. We've known that for millions of years. I mean, obviously, there are some mountains, there are some valleys, there are some oceans, but the world is flat, and the sun and all the planets revolve around the Earth, right? How do we get around that? Well, the first thing you have to do is look at the second definition of argument, that is, that set of reasons, and you line up a logical progression of reasons with proof. Now, lawyers do this. Dr. Nickerson calls it case building. And it's a deliberate form of confirmation bias where you select the evidence that you want, whether you're the prosecution or the defense, and you lay out your case, and you have the judge and the jury, and they make a decision. But what happens when you're having this conversation and there is no judge or jury? That's what we're really talking about. So I have a whole list of false arguments that people use, bad arguments that lead to attitude polarization, which means the disagreement gets worse as the argument goes on, or a belief perseverance, which is what happens when people continue to believe certain things are true even after we show them that it's false, as with the completely discredited vaccination research that was published and then retracted. But the vaccination issue didn't go away. In fact, it continued to grow until it had a life of its own. And it continues to haunt us today, even though it was fully retracted. So how do you get around this? You have to appeal to the head, the heart, and the guts of the matter. It's sort of a trifecta for getting people to change their minds. You have to understand how they make these decisions. The head, of course, is the home of logic and analysis. When you're making your case, you have to have your data and your facts. But if you want to change people's minds, you have to appeal to their hearts, where their passions and their emotions reside. And if you want to motivate people to do things, you have to appeal to their guts. That's where the instinct is, where people say, I have a gut feeling about this. So let's start with the guts for a minute. Fear monger, scare tactics. Speakers often start with the scary bits first. They want you to have a gut reaction and they want you to do something before you've had a chance to think it through. For every audience, you're gonna have to get to their minds, but first you're gonna have to go through their guts and their hearts, right? So exactly what did happen in the case of the Wakefield article? First came the scare tactic. Make no mistake about it. If you tell people that nine out of 12 kids are gonna come down with autism after the MMR vaccination, that's going to scare the heck out of them. Never mind, it was only nine out of 12 kids and there was no control group. Deliberate or not, this was a scare tactic. The damage was done. But then the story also aroused people's emotions. What could be more heartbreaking than someone you love, especially a child, coming down with autism after a vaccination, losing their ability to speak or interact normally with other kids? The research here was an example of another bad argument known as post hoc 
ergo propter hoc, or after this, because of this, or in layman's terms, confusing correlation with causation. Okay? There was never any connection proven between the MMR vaccination and autism. Here's another bad argument. It asks you to throw out millions of vaccination over the years and years and years of data in favor of a tiny single cohort of 12 and no control group. And finally, the tug at the heartstrings, no less a mother than Jenny McCarthy, picked up the baton when she claimed that her son's autism was caused by the vaccination. Now, even though she says she's not an anti-vaxxer, she's written books, she's been a guest on TV talk shows, and she continues to somehow infer the connection. Now, this is the kind of appeal to irrelevant authority that's the mainstay of modern media, and it's not a good thing. I'm sure Jenny McCarthy loves her kid, but that doesn't make the case that vaccinations cause autism. So now you know what you're up against. The challenge is, how do you convince parents to vaccinate their children when all they want to believe is what they already think they believe? How do you fight back against information and confirmation bias? First of all, don't be a scientist. And by that, I mean the facts alone will not be enough to wear down the opposition. You have to do what they do. You have to use all the tools, appeal to the instincts and the passions, the guts and the heartstrings, if you're going to have any hope of taking over the analytic mind. So first, throw a punch to the gut. According to the CDC, in 1920, there were half a million cases, 7,500 uh, 7, patients died of measles, and in 2000, we eliminated measles in the United States. Unless you want to see measles, millions of measles cases, mumps and rubella, you have got to vaccinate children. Now, the response you might get from the anti-vaxxers is, yes, but I heard about that report. Well, say something like this. I heard about that study, too, but you know what? It was bad science. There were only 12 kids, no control group. We have hundreds of years of studies that prove that this is an effective vaccination and never any proof of a connection with autism. Make it personal. But then you've got this paradox still. You can make it personal, you can make it real, and they will still disregard everything you've said. So here's my secret about winning arguments and changing minds. You can't win the argument, right? That's the given. But do this instead. Make your points, do what you can, and then walk away. And here's what will happen. You've given them now the information they need to make a new decision. You've made your point, but you didn't make it a contest. And so when their shields go down, when it isn't a matter of winning an argument or saving face, your message will sink in. Remember when you tossed out that great idea at a meeting once and you got shot down on the spot? And then remember about two weeks later your boss brought it up again? One day in the future when parent and child are at the doctor's office and a relevant authority like a pediatrician suggests that it's time for an MMR vaccine, that parent will probably remember what you said and the facts you presented. So when you think about confirmation bias, remember that many people can only handle one idea at a time, and they cling to what they learned first. Remember that according to Dr. Nickerson, the harder you press, the tighter they hold on to their original bias and push back. So you pull back. And remember that you may not be able to win the argument outright, but if you can get your audience to believe that yours is the lesser of two evils, you just might be able to change some attitudes. Thank you very much.